please remain standing as Jim is coming to read our scripture for us this morning. It comes out of the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 38. It's found there in your pew Bibles on page 707 if you would like to follow along. Again, Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 38. In the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon this, your word, and and make it be for us the word of life that we might be people of life. And now, God, hide me behind the cross that your message of love and grace might shine through and that it might pierce our very hearts on this day. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So Vicki, I'll call her Vicki, came into my office and she plopped down on the other side, on the chair, in the chair on the other side of my desk and she looked at me with hollow and exhausted eyes and said, uh, Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to go forward. So I said, well, tell me more. And so she began to outline the chaos of her life. She told me, uh, and, and, and by the way, I knew that being her pastor. She told me about her youngest son who was just absolutely infatuated with athletics. I had known that, I had recognized that I had been seeing Vicki and her husband and, and two children at church less and less. In fact, it, it had got to the point that they were, uh, they were coming to church once every, once every six weeks or so. And when I had just gone to that church, uh, when, I, when, I, when I had first arrived, they were every Sunday kind of Christians, but then they, they were, they'd found themselves just coming once every six weeks, maybe even once every, once every eight weeks, and she was absolutely overwhelmed with the chaos of, of their life. For you see, their, their youngest son was absolutely infatuated with athletics. He loved sports. Whatever the sport was, he wanted, he wanted to be a part of. And in fact, he not just only wanted, wanted to be part of that sport, he was part of that sport. And so he was involved in, in baseball and, and, and then also in basketball. He was a, he was a young boy of, of eight years old, and he was always involved in two, uh, two sports at one time. In the previous year, he had discovered soccer, and he absolutely loved soccer. And she was talking about how they were going from one sport to the next sport. They were going from one practice to the next practice, and they were on a couple of different traveling basketball teams, eight years old, mind you. And then, and then she had just heard that there was a new swimming club in town and she was trying to keep it secret from her son lest he hear about this new sport of swimming. And then she began to tell me about her older son. He was just a, a couple of years older. He was 11 at that time, and he was involved in, in academics. He, he, loved, he loved to learn, and so he was, in, he was involved in an academic club, and he was also involved in an elementary Spanish club, and he was on the, uh, he was on the academic bowl team, and, 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 and then he was also just now starting to get involved in band as well. And so she began to describe the chaos of their lives, how she and her husband met one another Go, coming and going, and and how they uh, the way these were the words that she used to describe it. We are just simply two people sharing the same children, happen to living in the same house. And she said it all comes from all of the chaos in our in our lives. And I I tried to. I, I, I tried to comfort her and, and tell her that it, that it would eventually would, would get easier, but I, but I looked at her with, with a little bit of, um, well, questioning in my own soul because I often tell parents, don't worry, it gets easier as your children get older, but I have found over the years that if, that if, that if we're not ready to, to set some standards in our own lives, we'll just, we'll continue We'll continue with that chaos in, in, our, in our lives. 
A poll was uh, conducted a number of years ago and asked, asked how, how busy do you feel? Americans, 69% of Americans say that they are very busy or that they, that they are busy or very busy. 69% of Americans say that they are busy or, or very busy were very busy. And another poll was conducted a, a few years ago, and out of that poll was a, 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 they, the authors of that poll or the conductors of that poll uh, developed a book, and they, they shared the results from, from that. And, and the title of that book is Simple Life. And, and some of the, well, the inspiration for this, for this series came from, uh, came from that book. And, and they asked, uh, they asked um, uh, married people about, about, their, about their own married life, and 80% of Eighty-four percent of the married respondents say that they they just simply need more time with their spouse. They recognize Americans recognize that we just simply don't spend enough time with our spouse. You know, it used they they used to say, well, you know, it's quality time over quantity time. Uh, and what I have found is, if you don't have the quantity of time, you're never going to get to the quality time that you need to have. We simply have to spend more time. Uh, together. And 44% of the respondents to this survey said that if I keep up my pace, I'm going to have some health concerns because of it. Almost half of Americans say that if they keep up the pace that they're, uh, that they're, that they're experiencing right now, the pace of life, the chaos of life, they're going to begin, they're going to, begin to experience some health concerns over, over the next few years. Well, the, the, the conductors of this survey, they began, to, they began to delve a little bit more uh, beneath the surface of those who had, who had answered the survey, and they began, to, uh, they began to personally interview some of these people, and, and here are some quotes from, from those interviews. One, one, one woman said, I, I just need more time in my day. This whole 24-hour thing just isn't working. I wish there were 25, 25 hours in a day, and the, and the authors of the book book, wondered, uh, wondered out loud on paper, I wonder what she would have done with that extra hour. <laughs> more than likely, she would have just stuffed it with more, with more activity. Another gentleman said, you know those guys who are, who are able to spin multiple plates on sticks without, without letting any of those plates fall? <laughs> That's how I feel. Maybe maybe you can't relate to it, but I know I know that I I know that I can that I can relate to it. It feels like that if we don't keep all those plate, plates spinning, and if we don't go from from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, well, well, the first plate's gonna gonna start wobbling and fall, and so we've got to rush around and, and 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 take care of that. And it seems like all of our life is just is just trying to keep all of those plates spinning, all all at once. But here's a stark reality, and you know this, but I want to say it out loud. We all have, we all have 24 hours a day. We all have seven days a week. We all have 365 days a year, and you cannot get any more time. You absolutely cannot get any more time. So last week, I, we, we, we've... Um, Continuing this sermon series, dealing with a, dealing with a simple life and what it means to have a what it means to live a simple life. So much of what we have today is is so very complex, and I, and and I think I think that as people of faith, we are called to live a simple life. We are called to to simplify in our lives. We've seen how well last week we looked at having simple relationships. And, and I, I challenge you to look at some of those relationships that you may need to work on and making a commitment to, to being there and, and build, rebuilding a relationship or strengthening a relationship. I told you it was a 10-day challenge. You've got a couple more days. Um, uh, uh, you've got a couple more days for that challenge. I hope that you have been, I hope that you've been working on those relationships. If you haven't, you have three or four more days to continue on. I would, I would strongly encourage you. I would strongly encourage you to continue to, um, to think about those relationships that you need to work on and, 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 simpl and simplify. And today, today, um, today we're talking about our, our complex relationship with, with time. In my travels around the world, I haven't, I haven't done a, a, 
a huge amount of travel, but one of the things that I have noticed, especially in traveling on some mission trips to Latin America, is that when, we show, when I've shown up to, to mission trips, I and my other mission trip uh, folks, we're the only ones with watches on. <laughs> no one else wears a watch. And so when we show up on a mission trip, this has happened every time that I've, that I've been on one, especially out of uh, those that are out of the country, uh, we'll ask, so what time does worship begin? And you know, 9.30. And so we're there. We show up to the church at 9 o'clock. We're ready. Uh, we're, we're hoping that they're going to have some coffee and donuts, and we show up, and uh, there's nobody else there at the church. And so we kind of wait around. The pastor normally wanders in at about 9.20, and so we're thinking, well, okay, well, everybody else will show up. And so 9.30 rolls around, and there's nobody else there yet. Church is supposed to start at 9.30. Around 9.35, some people start meandering in. 9.45, there are a few other people. We kind of get started at 9.45, 9.50, whenever the Spirit moves. <laughs> I have found that we as Americans are tied to our watches more than any other culture I have ever than I have ever seen. Even, even among Europeans, I've spent a little bit of time in Europe, and we as Americans, we are, we are tied to our watches more so than any other culture that I, have, that I have ever, ever seen. And I believe that there are some things, that, uh, things from Jesus that we can learn regarding our use of time. Capernaum is where Jesus was. Now, now we're, we're, we're reading here out of, the, out of the gospel of Mark. Mark is a different kind of gospel. I don't know if you've ever looked at the, uh, looked at the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke together. They, they all are, are, are quite different. Mark is extremely different. In Mark, we have no birth narratives. We don't hear where Jesus comes from necessarily. We don't hear anything about the Christmas story and the virgin birth. We don't hear anything about the, the, the wise men. It just simply starts out. It just simply starts out in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. And then he goes into the story of John the Baptist. And immediately, Jesus then is baptized and immediately begins his, his public ministry. So it, it's, it's very abrupt how, abrupt how it starts. And in, and in Mark's gospel, we find Jesus uh, in, in the little village of Capernaum. Capernaum was a small village on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. It was a, it was a small village of about 1,500 people. And here we find, um, we find that Jesus is, is calling his disciples. Peter lives there. And so uh, Jesus has called some disciples. Peter is one of, already one of his early disciples. And so he goes to see, um, he goes to Peter's house, and, and Peter's mother in law is ill. And so Jesus heals her. And then she was able to, to serve them the rest of that day. And then word got out very quickly of what had happened earlier that morning. And so there were others that, that, started, that, that started coming. There was, a, uh, there was a man with an unclean spirit. And Jesus cast out that unclean spirit, that, that unclean spirit that had been tormenting him. Uh, and, and, and word began to spread even more. In fact, so much so that it appears as though there, were, there was a line that had formed outside the door of Peter's mother-in-law's house. And Jesus was, was there to heal them. And he stayed, it appears as though, he stayed the rest of the afternoon, probably even into the evening. And it very well may have been that he, he stayed there ministering uh, to people throughout the rest of that night, probably until there was no one else in line. And then, as so often is the case, Jesus immediately goes away. He, he, he went to sleep that night. Immediately the next morning, he got up, he left the synagogue, and, uh, no, he, he, uh, he rose the next morning while it was still dark. He departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. I, want, I, don't, I, don't, want you to, I don't want you to miss out on that. I mean, I think that's an important part of what Jesus is doing here. He immediately went out in spite of, of uh, he knew that there was going to be lots and lots of people waiting for him back in town. He needed to be revived. He needed to be refreshed. He needed to be renewed. Dear friends, we mustn't be too, uh, too busy not to pray. In fact, in fact, um, I believe that we can never be too busy to not pray. Prayer 
better be at the very center of who we are. If we're going to understand our relationship with time and the busyness and complexity of our lives, it begins right there with prayer. But here's the fascinating thing that I want, but that I want, that I want you to think about this story. Listen to what Jesus said. Listen, listen to what Jesus said next. This is fascinating. And Simon, Peter, and those who were with him, they searched for him and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you, meaning that everyone is looking for you. They heard what went on yesterday. You've just started this ministry. Jesus, you are a rock star. <laughs> you want to talk about a church plant ready to just explode you want, you want to talk about a, a movement just ready to explode. People are getting ready to absolutely flock to Jesus because of what he had done. I would have expected, I, I, I mean, if it, would have, if it would have been me, I would have put on my skinny jeans. I would have put on a really cool shirt, and I would have gone out and preached. I, I would, I'd have done everything I could that day uh, to, to reach as many people as I could. But that's not what Jesus did. Note, notice, what, notice what he says. He said, let us go on to the next towns so that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. And immediately he left Capernaum and he went out into the countryside because Jesus knew what his priority was and his priority, he had come not to heal all the sick. That's not why Jesus had come. He came to preach the good news that God was for them and that, that, that salvation was going to be offered for all through him. That was why he came. And so he recognized his priority. He recognized why, why he was there. You see, I believe that there is a massive difference between the urgent and the important. The urgent in Jesus' life was that there were a whole bunch of sick people here that needed, that, that needed to be healed. There were a bunch of things that he, that he needed to do, but Jesus recognized the more important thing, the more important thing. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, we must understand the difference between, between the immediate and, and the important. Jesus recognized his his priorities. He recognized that he couldn't do it all. And some of us, some of us have not yet recognized that. We believe, some of us believe that, that we are called to be a savior <laughs> in our own families, in our own places of work, in our own households. We, we, if, if we don't keep all these plates spinning, <laughs> well, then everything's just going to fall apart. But Jesus knew his priorities. He recognized the difference between, between the important and, and, the, and the immediate. And he understood that his first priority was to preach throughout the area. You, no matter what else came, upon, uh, came about, his first priority was to preach about, about that area. Peter Drucker says this, the supply of time is, is inelastic. No matter how high the demand, the supply will not go up. There is no price for it. There's no price for time. Moreover, time is totally perishable and cannot be stored. Yesterday's time is gone forever and will never come back. Time is therefore always an exceedingly short supply. But Jesus recognized, Jesus recognized that we must learn to, to say no to something good so that we can say yes to something better. You may even want to jot that down because I think that is so very important. He, he lived that out. Was it bad for him to stay in Capernaum and to heal the people? No, not at all. Not at all. That was so good. But there was something even better. You see, in, 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 in the next verses here, in, in, in verse 40, here we have Jesus um, immediately after he goes into the, into the other areas, he begins, he begins, to, he begins to minister in, in greater and more astounding ways. He, he comes upon a leper. And I mean, if you know anything about leprosy at that time, someone who was, uh, who was experiencing leprosy, it was a skin disorder. 
Uh, there, there's still some questions about what exactly that is. They, they threw a lot of different kinds of skin disorders there in leprosy. But if you were deemed a leper, uh, you had to cover those parts of your body that were, that were infected with leprosy. And you were, you were, I mean, you could not stay inside the city. You had to stay outside the city gates. Oftentimes, there were even leper colonies. And if you did come into town, you were required by law to shout out, leper, leper, so that no one had any, uh, so that no one would touch you at all. Because they believed that leprosy was, uh, could be passed from one person to another very, very easily. And here in this next passage, we have Jesus seeing this leper. He goes to him and he touches him and he heals him. That was a whole different level of ministry than what he had been experiencing before. Jesus was able to say no to something that was good, staying in Capernaum, so that he, he could say yes to something that was even better. Friends, you and I, we need to understand and know how to say no. We need to, know, we need to understand the importance of saying no to something good so that we can say yes to something better. What if I told you that if you had that you had seventy three hundred dollars to live on for the next twenty years? I mean that seems a little unrealistic, doesn't it? Say say I tell you you have seventy three hundred dollars to live on in the next year. How, what would you begin to do? That's all the money you had. You have seventy three hundred dollars, and that's it. So what, what would you begin to do? You'd begin to, to make a budget. <laughs> You'd figure out, okay, what are the most important things that I'm going to have to buy over the next year? I'm, I'm probably going to put food on there, maybe probably some, some shelter, um, maybe clothing, but, prob- but maybe even not. I mean, you may not have enough for clothing. Uh, you're, you, I mean, you know, it's probably not, maybe not your big house and maybe not your car. And, and maybe, I mean, you may, you may, cancel that Netflix uh, really quickly. You may get rid of your, your telephone very quickly because, I mean, $7,300 over a year, it immediately makes you recognize what are the most important things in your life, doesn't it? You have 7,300 days over the next 20 years. What if you began to treat those days like they were money? And you began to prioritize your prioritize your life just like you would prioritize and and budget $7,300 that you would be able to have to live on? What if you began to to budget and prioritize your time because you only have a certain amount of time? I think, I think that we must come to understand what our priorities are in our lives. So just like we did last week, take out your bulletin. Take out your bulletin. There on the back of your bulletin, there's a place for you to write if you, don't have, if you don't have a bulletin, take out a piece of paper, take out a connection card there in front of you. I want you to begin to write down what are your, what are your top five priorities in your life. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a cheat sheet here because your, yours may look something like this. It may not. It may not. Yours may be a little bit different. But I would guess, I would guess that those of us who call ourselves Christians, I would guess if we say that God is number one, we might want to put God number one there. Uh, and then you can fill those in. However, whatever other priorities you have in, our, in your life, what other areas of your life that you think are the first or the top five most important priorities? You may have entertainment in there. You may have uh, your favorite athletic team. I don't I don't know. There was a big game yesterday. I know. I don't have any idea. I'm not sure what you would replace that with, but um, you've, you've got some things there. So I'm going to give you just, just a couple minutes to do that. To, to, what are the top, top five most important things in, in, your, in your life? So again, again, Jesus knew his top priority. I mean, I think Jesus' first priority would be God, but second priority probably would be, would be, would be preaching and, and, and bringing in the kingdom of God. Now, on, on, I mean, I think probably third or maybe even fourth down that list would be healing those that he came into contact with, but he knew he had a higher priority. And so he knew the priorities of his life, and then, and then it's real simple begin to align our days 
to match our priorities. I mean, think about it that way. Begin to align our days to, to, match, to match our priorities. If God is more important than, our, than, than a TV show, well, then turn off the TV show and begin to spend some time with God. Turn off the news. It's the same. I promise you, it's the same every day. <laughs> I know what it's going to be. There's going to be violence over here, and there's going to be a, 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 a politician that's going to say something a little wacky over there. It's the same thing. I could have said this 25 years ago, by the way, and it would have been the exact same thing. If God is the top priority in your life, then we need to make God the top priority in our lives. If, if, if our family is, is more important than entertainment, then we need to make family more important than entertainment. If our, if our health is more important than our job, then, then it may be that we don't need to take that second job, or it may be that we don't need to take, uh, 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 take that promotion because it's going to require another 20 hours a week, and we're already have an ulcer, and we're already uh, have high blood pressure. We can't handle it the way it is. Begin to align our begin to align our days and our lives with those priorities in our life. Let me tell you how it's played. This, is, this has played out in my own life. When our daughter Morgan was a, young, was a young girl, she was really good at dance. She was a dancer. In fact, we, um, she was involved in lots of, lots of activities. She loved, she loved athletics. Um, she loved athletics, and we, she was bound to determine when she was, I don't know, six or seven, she was going to play flag football. She was the only girl on the flag football team. She was bound to determine she was going to be a football player, and so uh, we knew that it probably wasn't going to last. When we saw her out on the football field in the huddle, she was tap dancing, literally. She was tap dancing in her cleats. She loved dance so much. Uh, she was really good at it, too. She was really good. She had, the, she had a short stature, just like a, a, a dancer. She, I mean, she was really, really good. And so she was just in regular dance uh, competitions, local, local kinds of stuff. And um, uh, her instructor came to us, and she had gotten to the age that um, they really weren't offering a whole lot for those that weren't in competitive dance. And so her instructor came to us and said, hey, we would love for Morgan to, to enter into the competitions uh, stuff. I mean... And, and, and this, uh, and, and this, I mean, her teacher was an amazing teacher. They had won dance competitions all over the United States. And so we started talking with her more about that and what that, what that was like. And, and we recognized that it was, uh, there was seven or eight or, or 10 different, um, dance costumes. And we were, you know, all of those were, you know, 150 to $200 a piece. And then, and then what was the kicker for us? Uh, we, we realized that it was about 15 weekends a year. And those dance competitions were Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, I mean, we, um, we made, by the way, we made the decision for our daughter. Parents, hear me say that. We made the decision for our daughter that she was not going to be involved in competitive dance. Because we were not willing for her to, uh, to, to, to give her life to dance when we knew that she could have given her life to Christ and her faith. And now she's um, 20, however old she is, 23, 23, recently married, uh, 23 and recently married, and she is an amazing person of faith. She could have been a better dancer than she is today. But she gave her heart and her life to her faith. You see, if we say that God is a top priority in our lives and in the life of our family, well, then live like it. Make God a top priority in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we, in the way that we structure our days, in the way, in the way that, that, we, that we schedule. So again, if we say that family is a higher priority than entertainment, turn off the TV and spend some time Spend some time with family. Make, make that trip to go see your kids or, or grandkids. Or, or, or make sure that you go to that game, uh, to that t-ball game of, of your grandson. And, and, and instead of doing the activities that, that, that you think are, are pretty important, but they're, they pale in comparison to family. I've had the great opportunity. I've had the great opportunity to, um, 
to hold the hands of those who are on their deathbed. It's, it's the most sacred thing that I've done in my 21 years of, of, being, of being a pastor is holding the hands of those who are, who are on their deathbed. And time after time after time, and this has happened dozens of times, time after time after time, they look me in the eye and they tell me, Pastor, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I've yet to have anyone, I've yet to have anyone tell me, boy, I sure, I, I sure hate that I missed that Thunder game. <laughs> None of them say that. None of them say, boy, I wish I would, I, I, I wish I would have spent more on, that, on my last car. I, w- I wish I would have lived in a bigger house. I wish that I would have taken, I wish that I would have, I would have, I would have taken that other job that would have, that would have taken me from my family more, but gosh, we would have made so much money. None of them say that. They all recognize at the end of their lives what their life priority really was. So, we know what God has called us to do. We know the way that God has called us to structure our lives. We know what is the very center of our lives. We've already said it today. We have one true God we have one true God. We, let's, let's not just say it with our mouth today, but let's live it with our lives. Amen. Would you bow with me? Oh God, we thank you for the, the grace and love that you have, that you have shared with us. God, you, we are just overwhelmed by your love. And oftentimes we, we act as if your, well, your love and forgiveness is just automatic and that's just part of kind of just, just a normal and that's just a part of our lives. It's not our whole lives. God, today, help us to recognize that our relationship with you, our relationship with our families, our health, those are the very core of what you have entrusted to us. So God, help us to not just say that you are first in our lives. Today, help us to live like it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.